But what it does mean, leaders must have a sense of timing. We call it measurable progress. You've got to be smart enough to measure progress, and you've got to also be smart enough to understand reasonable time. We can't be unreasonable with time. The enterprise may be lost for lingering too long and not understanding the law of averages. Here's the last part. Leaders must understand the fact that there is both good and evil. It's part of the life scenario to understand good and evil. And however you wish to describe good and however you wish to frame your ideology of evil, there are a lot of ways to put it. For some people, evil is too strong a word. I don't know. This is part of your own philosophical conclusions that you have to come to in trying to evaluate this earthly struggle. Evil, good, tyranny, liberty, sickness, health, winning, losing, life, death, opportunity, tragedy. It's part of the life scenario. And part of it is described in rather philosophical terms on a fairly higher plane called the great war between good and evil. Now here's part of the scenario. When the Founding Fathers put this country together, they said, we want maximum liberty and minimum law, but we do have to have minimum law to restrain that mysterious dark side of our nature. Because sure enough, even though we've got a good thing going called America, there are probably some people who are not going to run by the rules. So not only will we build some cities, we probably better build some jails. Why? Just to be bright enough to understand this clash, this scenario of good and evil. And all good leaders must understand this clash, this scenario, however you wish to describe it, whatever terms you wish to call it. We must understand it. Now, here's part of the understanding. Some people have sold out to the evil side for whatever reason. You don't have to spend much time with why. All you have to do is spend time with who. I went to my 30th year class reunion a few years ago. Little small village, right, I grew up in. There was only about 150 in the graduating class. And after 30 years, almost half of the graduating class was at the reunion, which was pretty good. We had a two-day celebration. I'm master of ceremonies. On the second day, we had a little moment to remember those who had deceased. I think there were eight. And I knew them all, so I gave a little scenario, a little story about each one. And then we took time, just a little moment of silence, to remember, because some of them were very, very unique human beings. But they were gone. I thought later, eight out of 150 after 30 years. Is that about average? Guess what I discovered? It's about average. So after 30 years out of 150, it's not will eight be missing, it is only who will be missing. So in part of the scenario of understanding leadership, the key is to not be surprised when the inevitable occurs. Because if you become too surprised, we will call you naive. <laughs> if the sun goes down, the guy says, what's happened, what's happened? It means he hasn't been here long, I guess, right? Or the guy is naive. Come on, come on. There are some things you don't want to look surprised, especially in public. If you say, why did John do that? You say, come on, come on. About so many, after so much time, are going to. And it's very sobering as to why some have chosen to give themselves over to evil. And we call it simply one of those things. But the key to leadership is to understand, and the key to leadership is to also be alert and be bright enough to spot it and to see it. All good leaders must understand the story of the frog and the scorpion. 
It's one of the most important stories for a leader to understand. According to the story of the frog and the scorpion, the story scenario says, the frog and the scorpion appeared on the bank of a river about the same time, and the frog was about to jump in the river and swim to the other side. And along comes the scorpion, and he sees what's about to happen, and he engages the frog in conversation, and the scorpion says to the frog, Mr. Frog, I see that you're about to jump in the river and swim to the other side. And the frog said to the scorpion, that is correct. And the scorpion said, hey, hey, hold it. I would like to get to the other side, but unfortunately I'm a scorpion and I can't swim. Would you be so kind as to let me hop on your back and you swim across the river and deposit me on the other side? I would be grateful. And the frog looked at the scorpion and said, no way. The frog said, you're a scorpion. And scorpions sting frogs and kill them. He said, I'd get out there halfway with you on my back and you'd sting me. And I'd die. You think I'm crazy? No way. The scorpion said, hey, hey, hold it, hold it. With your frog brain, you're not thinking. <laughs> if I was to sting you out there halfway, sure, you'd die and drown, but so would I, since I'm a scorpion and I can't swim. That'd be kind of foolish. So I'm not about to do that. I just want to get to the other side. The frog thought over that reasoning and said, that makes sense, hop on. And according to the story, the scorpion hops on the frog's back, they start across the river, and sure enough, halfway across the river, the scorpion stings the frog. They are now both about to go down for the third time. The frog cannot believe <laughs> what happened. And he said to the scorpion, why did you do that? I'm about to die and drown, but so are you. Why would you do that? And the scorpion said, because I am a scorpion. So all leaders must understand the story of the frog and the scorpion. There are shepherds and there are sheep and there are wolves and wise Leaders must understand some wolves are so clever, they've learned to dress up like sheep. But do not miss the story of the full drama of life called good and evil. It's part of the test of leadership skill, awareness, sensitivity, understanding, knowing the scenario and being on the alert for what is called the inevitable. Let me give you now, just in sort of quick succession, some studies that leaders should engage in. Let me just give you the list. We won't expand on this, but I'm sure you can expand on it in your own good time and in your own good way. But let me give you this list of studies leaders should engage in. Number one, the study of possibility. Possibility. It's so important for leaders to play the what-if game. What if we had enough people? What if we had refined people? What if we had leaders? What if we had a good team? What if we went to the market? What if we accomplished our goal? What could we accomplish? What are the dimensions? What's the size? What's the promise? We call it the what-if game. Possibilities are all around us. We must all be students of possibility. Dr. Schuler calls it possibility thinking. It's not a bad subject for study, possibilities. Number two is opportunity. Leaders must always be conscious and aware of the expanded potential for opportunity. And sometimes opportunity is closer than you think. The next subject of study is ability. Leaders must be good students of ability, their ability, and the people that are in their charge, their influence, their ability. Sometimes it's easy to have somebody right close to you and you've never discovered all of their talent and their potential. I discovered a young man in Canada, Harold Dyke, many years ago. He worked for the railroad. I think he was making about $300 a month. He'd been there 10 years. Now, this was a long time ago. But I discovered him. He became a good friend of mine. And I recruited him. And he joined my company, joined my business. The second year he was with me, he made $45,000. And now he's a leader in the community and he's gifted and skillful and he's financially independent and he's a unique gentleman. Now the railroad had him for 10 years. 
and they didn't know who they had. They didn't have this in-depth survey of trying to find the people that are right close around who may have some unusual gifts and capacities that nobody has yet discovered. So leaders must be students of ability and find ways to uncover somebody's unusual ability that may have been there for a while. And you've just got to find a way to uncover all of that. Part of the key to leadership. Subject number four, inevitability. All of us should be students of inevitability. Without kidding myself, if I keep up my current daily practices, where will it take me in 10 years without being disillusioned? I don't want to just cross my fingers and walk the wrong road. I got to learn to look into the future called inevitable. Inevitability is being 200 feet from Niagara Falls in a little boat with no motor and no oars. It's called... It's over. <laughs> now, the key to that tragic story and scenario is, what a tragic place to find yourself. If somebody would have painted you this scene when you were still upstream and painted the roar of the falls in your mind and would show you what a tragic place it is, you might not have drifted this far into what we call now the inevitable. We've got to help people by painting the roar of the falls long before they get 200 feet in a little boat with no motor and no oars. You say, well, the roar of the falls is a long ways off. Yes, but the people that are around you are drifting, drifting. And by perception, you've got to see it. And you've got to level and you've got to speak the truth so that you can give them alternate choices while there are still alternate choices. It's called the gift of leadership, helping people in life change career change, helping people in thinking change, helping people with attitude change, to paint the inevitable. It's a key to leadership. Number five, an important subject for leaders to study is called rationality. Being able to rightly conclude based on information a rational, sensible course. I've got a good clue for you. Make sure what you do is the product of your own conclusion. Take advice, but not orders. Let everybody around you be helpful, but then put that through your own mental computer and make sure what you do is the product of what you've concluded based on all the input. We call this a true sense of leadership, developing rationality based on all the input. These are not easy tasks, but they're tasks that are possible. This is called walking the summit of leadership skills. And most people don't want to engage in these extra disciplines, but I'm here to promise you that the treasure and the equity is so unique that what small price is paid in these early disciplines is small compared to the treasure that accumulates as the days unfold, both for your heart and your mind and your purse. To finish, let me give you some challenges. In wrapping all of this up, I've got some good challenges for you to consider. Here's the first one. Let other people lead small lives, but not you. In the challenge of leadership and stepping up to the responsibility and the opportunity to touch somebody else's life, to help give somebody else light and direction and refinement of thought and character and activity, potential, opportunity, dreams, price. In all of this, let everybody else lead the small lives, but not you. Let everybody else cry over small hurts, but not you. Let everybody else argue over non-essentials, but not you. Deal in things that matter. The larger challenge, the larger opportunity. Here's my next challenge. As leaders, let's learn to help people not just with their jobs, but with their lives. I think we have a twofold responsibility to help people with job skills. But I think the greater responsibility is to help people with life skills. Let's don't just teach people how to work. Let's teach people how to live, how to assimilate and accumulate far greater treasures than just a paycheck. The treasures of awareness, understanding, setting goals, reaching into the future, growing, changing, expanding. If we'll touch people's lives as well as their skills, if they stay with us a week or a month or a year or a lifetime, on whatever occasion they should choose to leave, 
you want them to leave by saying, my experience there was the greatest experience of my life. And it wasn't just what I earned, it was what I learned. And last, I have an ancient scenario to give you. It comes from the Bible, and here's what it says. If you work on your gifts, they will make room for you. If you practice your gifts, your gifts will make a place for you, a place of leadership, a place of influence, a place to touch someone else, to make a mark, to further an enterprise, to build a dream. Someday, if you work on your gifts, we will call you noble. We may give you rewards you cannot even now imagine. Plaques to hang on your wall, trophies to remember, but most of all, the gift of knowing yourself, that you did the best you could with what you had, the expansion of your mind and your heart and your soul and your touch and your reach and all the gifts that you possess. Your gifts, if you work on them, will make a room for you. And I've got to be one of the better examples of that. Look where my gifts have brought me. I was raised in obscurity, a little small village in Idaho. I now get to travel around the world. My gifts have brought me to this room. And what an experience it is for me to have a chance to touch you. One of the most challenging experiences in life is seeing what you can do to help someone else. And one of the greatest thrills in life is to be able to invest life into life. And you've given me that opportunity tonight, and I want to thank you for that. I've invested a bit of my life into your life, and I've considered it worth it. I want to thank you for giving me this chance and this opportunity. I wish you leadership. I wish you influence. I wish you treasures of the soul and the spirit and the mind and the purse. And hopefully what we've had to share with you today has given you a sense of extra perception in sharpening your skills and making your life unique. Let's go touch somebody else. Thank you.